today, ASIC fail. Sterling first, victims last. Hello, Gannis Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, where I'm those posts covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today, I'm joined by Robbie Barwick from the Citizens Party. Hi, Robbie. Hi, Martin. Well, here we are again, and we're going to grumble about regulation again, regulation that's frankly gone off the rails. Yeah, we are, but um, we also have an, a, one of those windows of opportunity where we might be able to do something about it. So what I'd like to do is um, play a video that our organisation has produced about a story that uh, we've been following for a while now. It relates to a financial scandal over, that's largely in Western Australia, but there's victims all around Australia called Sterling First, the collapse of Sterling First in 2019. So let's just play it. People can see the story and then we can take up the discussion. Okay, here we go. Over 100 elderly victims of the Sterling First scam are another demonstration of the financial corruption which Australia must clean out. I'm Robert Barwick of the Citizens Party. We'll tell you the shocking story of the Sterling First scandal in a minute and the truly disgusting role that the federal regulatory agency ASIC played. Before we do, you should know that the way to clean out financial corruption starts with breaking the banking monopoly of the big four banks by creating an Australia Post People's Bank. Such a public bank would break the stranglehold the big four banks have over Australia. Here's a clip from Channel 10 News First reporting on the Sterling First scandal. A kick in the guts for these retirees. Their life savings lost in the failed Sterling First scheme. Now the Supreme Court's ruled to kick them out of their homes. I've got nowhere to go. They're going to take me out of there in a wheelchair. I'm not moving out. The Sterling First scam targeted elderly victims by promising them they would have their rent paid for the rest of their lives in exchange for a fixed amount. They were told their money was being put into a trust that would pay the rent. In fact, they were duped into putting their life savings into a convoluted managed investment scheme. When Sterling collapsed in 2019, 140 elderly victims lost everything, and many now face eviction from their homes. The thrown us out in the street. 70, 60, 70, 80, nearly 90 year old people out in the street. Beryl and her husband Ray are two of those victims. Before they signed the agreement, Beryl called the Australian Securities and Investments Commission and asked if there were any red flags about Sterling. ASIC is the government agency responsible for protecting people against such fraud. Beryl was told ASIC had no concerns about Sterling. But ASIC knew that wasn't true. In fact, the founder of Sterling First was Ray Jones, who was discharged from bankruptcy in 2015. Ray Jones had been involved in other financial scandals in which mum and dad investors lost millions. The Financial Review reported in 1991 that, quote, investors had little indication they were investing in the rickety corporate empire of Mr. Ray Jones, end quote. Investors lost $30 million. Did ASIC know about Ray Jones? Of course they did. Another key figure in Sterling First is Simon Bell, one of their directors. Simon Bell was a key figure in the disastrous property development Ponzi scheme West Point, which collapsed into receivership in 2006 with total losses of $388 million, of which less than half was recovered for investors. Take a look at this screenshot from the ASIC website. Did ASIC know about West Point? Obviously they did. ASIC received complaints about Sterling starting in 2015. According to the founder of the Banking and Finance Consumers Support Association and advocate for Sterling victims, Denise Braley, ASIC finally moved against Sterling first in September 2017 to stop them from selling more of their snake oil. Incredibly, however, ASIC allowed Sterling to set up a new shell called Silverlink. The new company raised another $8 million from unsuspecting victims until it was finally shut down. These elderly victims deserve to be compensated for ASIC's negligence. What we've related here is the tip of the iceberg. 
There is the smell of corruption all over this affair. Why was this allowed to happen? And why haven't the government and ASIC not done anything about it? How high up does this scandal go? We demand a Senate inquiry into ASIC and the Sterling First affair. It's the first step in creating a whole new atmosphere in Canberra. It's time to have real regulations and honest regulators. But we also need to restructure the financial system itself. By establishing a Commonwealth Postal Savings Bank, we force the big four to compete, thereby breaking their monopoly. The mere presence of a public banking alternative will support the regulatory health of the financial system. The CPSB would invest in the real economy rather than speculative bubbles. It will begin to fence off a part of the financial system that is safe, where everyday people will be protected from financial predators. Please sign our petition calling for a National Australia Post Bank. No one should have to suffer the agony of seeing their life savings disappear and be thrown out into the street when the regulatory agencies could have easily prevented it. Please sign our petition and spread the word about it. Right, well, there you go. A very, very important story there. And it really does lay bare the whole question of who's regulating who for what reason. Sure is. And um, now, Martin, the Sterling First, when it comes to ASIC's failings, the Sterling First scandal actually just barely touches the side. It's still a huge problem out there. Um, this is a particularly uh, affecting scandal though because you know there's all these these 140 odd elderly victims they don't get to, they don't have an opportunity to start again um and it really is uh terrible what that the, that they're just being handballed around buck pass between different government agencies like asic afca the the um what do they call it the uh, compensation scheme of last resort etc but nothing is being done to address the fact that asic failed so badly um, and just for just because I know it'll come up, I want to address this question of caveat emptor. Um, you know, let the buyer beware because you know you could you could pick apart any given transaction that these these individual retirees entered into and say, oh, why did they sign that paperwork, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but I've talked to enough of them now to know that they had these smooth salesmen over there that had perfected the art of targeting elderly people right and if you're a if you're a, a, a um if you're that kind of person you know and you're you're good at your, at your sales you you develop techniques you know what how you can persuade people to do things that maybe they otherwise wouldn't do um and and so you can say that's foolish but no nobody walks around with a pitt street lawyer in their pocket to double check everything they do. That's not the real world. And the real world is that there are people out there who do take advantage of, of um, unsophisticated sections of the community and we're supposed to have a tough cop on the beat. And the video shows the tough cop knew who these people were, knew who these directors were. And when they were asked if there were any red flags, they denied it. And then, um, you know, there's, there's more, the WA government raised, um, uh, complaints that ASIC ignored, etc. Right. So, so we've got a situation here, and, and it comes down to this. It's a clear-cut case where the government failed these people. They don't have the opportunity to start again. So something's got to be done, or else they're all going to be out on the street. Um, why won't the government own up to its own failings, its own agency's failings, and act on it for, for a simple reason? Because you can't just act on it without having to overhaul the agency that failed, they would, you, you can't just say, oh, we'll, we'll give them a bit of compensation. You know, that, that's not going to fly in anyone's universe. And they don't want to overhaul the agency. They, ASIC is deliberately kept weak and ineffective. And why? Not because, not because Josh um, Frydenberg and Scott Morrison ha might have some connection to these Sterling First directors, because that's what benefits the big boys, the big four banks. They're the reason ASIC is kept weak and ineffective. And so to protect them, that's what our government does, protects the banks at all costs. Um, they keep the regulator so weak and ineffective it can't do its basic policing job. And this has to be addressed. So 
what we're um, what I'm going to ask people to do today, this is one of those calls where we'll, we'll, we've got a few more things to talk about, but I just want to flag it now and we'll give more details at the end. Next week, Parliament sits for the last time for about six weeks, and then it's only got two more sitting, sitting weeks in the year. We need to demand an inquiry, a Senate inquiry, and I say Senate because you and I have talked quite a bit in the last year or so about how the makeup of this Senate is, is actually fairly good in terms of the, the broad, um, especially with the cross benches, the broad commitment to actually trying to dig into some of this stuff, right? So this Senate needs to needs to initiate an inquiry into ASIC, into the government's intentions following the Royal Commission. What, what are they doing to clean up the banking system? Into the things they've clearly done, and we'll list them in a minute, to undermine any, any real intention to um, clean up the banking system and the, and the overall financial system. And Sterling first should be one of the terms of reference of that inquiry. And we need people to get on the phone and phone your all your senators in your state this next week, or sorry, this week, starting today, Monday. Um, this is the last, this is the last sitting. Full, 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 full confession. We're recording this on a Saturday to put up on a Monday. Um, so it's this week. Um, get on the phone. Call those guys and say you've got to have an inquiry into ASIC and you've got to look at the Sterling First case. And then they can, they can look at any other case as well, right? But it must be addressed. And um, you may find that, I mean, the crossbenchers will generally support it, you know, et cetera. Um, it comes down to what the Labor Party will do. And I think with what Frydenberg did this week, um, or this last week now, I think what Josh Frydenberg did, uh, Martin, is, is actually going to make the Labor Party inclined to look at this because he's released this statement of expectations, which, well, you've, you've, you've known banking and regulation longer than even I have. What do you think of it? Well, it's a remarkably weird document insofar that basically it is another uh, step in the emasculation of ASIC, right? And if you go back a bit, right, um, after the Royal Commission, ASIC did actually find its mojo for a bit and started pushing into the things they should have been pushing into in terms of you know banking conduct. They'd already uh, a decade ago put in responsible lending obligations which the banks hated. But since then it's all come unscrambled. You know we, we, the Shipton affair kicked. You know he got kicked out for various reasons, and the whole emphasis now from the government is we don't want too much regulation because we need to. You know, drive economic growth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right. So, you know, left, right, and centre, ASIC is being crippled so that it can't do its job. It has no mandate to do its job. And uh, of course, if you go back to responsible lending, they try to get that through. We actually helped to perhaps uh, make that uh, less lightly in terms of the removal of responsible lending, responsible lending protections. But what they were trying to do was to put it back onto APRA because APRA is only interested in financial stability. It's got no interest in the protection of consumers or small businesses and, and the conduct. So what's happening is that that note that came out from Frydenberg this last week, which basically has driven the strategy of um, ASIC over the next little while, is just more and more smokescreen, you know, hardly any real focus on the things that are really critical. And frankly, it's being degraded and degraded. They're actually going to spend less, despite the fact they're going to have more people, they're going to spend less than they did last year. And at the end of the day, the critical protections that need to be there because of the unequal relationship between our big financial organisations and individuals and small businesses, um, it's just being eroded. And yep. it's all down to, uh, you know, spurious claims about economic recovery and responding to COVID, so they wrap it in all of this stuff again. But fundamentally, the regulatory protections that are required in the system here to protect Australians is being degraded, and it's by political design. Well, I've got, an, I've got an analogy for you. When they have the AFL grand final and probably the rugby league one as well, there's a ring of cops inside the fence, between the fence and the boundary line. But they're not watching the grand final generally. They're watching the crowd because it's up to them to make sure that as the crowd's having a good time, the, the troublemakers don't ruin it for everybody and they can be identified and dragged out. That's what cops do. They're not here to have a good time. They're here to keep 
everybody safe and lawful so that everybody can have a good time. But that's not their job. No. What, what Josh Frydenberg has done with this is saying we're, it's, it's party time for the financial system. We want to unleash the financial system to do what it does. And we expect the cop, the, the so-called tough cop on the beat, that's what ASIC tried to claim, <laughs> tried to claim it, was, it was before the Royal Commission, um, and it proved to be anything but. Um, we expect the tough cop on the beat to help us party, and not by making sure everyone's safe. But listen, boys, come and have a drink too. The actual statement um, you, you can get on the uh, you can get on the ASIC website and read this now. The statement of expectations. The point two is the government expects ASIC to identify and pursue opportunities to contribute to the government's economic goals including supporting Australia's economic recovery from the COVID pandemic. Now, that is not its job. Its job is to make sure that as the banks respond to the government's call, now, you know, we can talk about that in terms of how one-dimensional it is, just let's pump up the property market again, boys. Anyway, whatever. As they respond to that call, it's ASIC's job to be on their case saying, are you preying on people? Are, you, are, you, are we going to see a a repeat of the no doc and low doc loans and all that kind of stuff, right? Or the 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 um the uh, ARIP asset rich income poor um, victims that got preyed on by the banks. So we're going to see a repeat of that. No, we're on your case. We're we're, we're going to make sure you don't do that. That's ASIC's job, right? That it's not a free for all. You you want to help things. You want to help with the economic recovery. Do it legally and do it in the real economy. Otherwise, we're here to make sure that anyone who screws up gets held accountable. That's ASIC's job. But that's what the government is basically saying in this document they don't want ASIC to do. And we documented in the last few months, um, and you and I talked about it on, on, on this program, that what happened to Shipton, J James Shipton and, and yep. Daniel Crennan. And, and just, you know, just a couple of predicates. As you mentioned, responsible lending was the big one. Um, at the, uh, Shipton took seriously... Commissioner Haynes saying, why not litigate? And now Andrew Shmulo at the um, uh, University of Wollongong has commented on this statement of expectation saying it's replaced why not litigate with why not capitulate. Um, it, was, it was appealing. Oh, oh, and, and in terms of why not litigate, a concrete, and I don't have the actual numbers, but before 2019, ASIC had, um, had always been uh, resorting to these enforceable undertakings to discipline the bank. And there were, you know, dozens and dozens, many dozens of them per year, enforceable undertakings. And this, and enforceable undertakings were like, um, you know, sl slapping the banks over the wrist with a wet lettuce, right? Look at the figures for 2019 and 20, 2020. The number of enforceable undertakings collapsed down to next to nothing. And instead it was court cases. ASIC and Crennan ratcheted up the court cases. Um, they went. They were quite serious on this. They were going. They took. Uh, they took Westpac to court on the Wagyu and Shiraz decision, and um, when that lost, well, that, that had already started, I think. But when when it lost, they were going to appeal that. And the big heavies, the government, the Reserve Bank governor, the Secretary of the Treasury, came down and said, "Do not appeal that decision. Right? We do not want a court ruling that can um, uh, be be on the record to say banks shouldn't lend." against those standards, right? Banks have to be more attentive to whether people can afford to pay back. So that was another predicate. And the final one we just discovered actually uh, is one of the things that ASIC had done under Crennan and Shipton is they had suspended this obscure little thing called equivalence relief, which had allowed uh, British banks to operate in Australia without a license because the, the, the logic is, oh, that's an equivalent financial system you know, same language, you know, same rules. They can just come here. We don't need to vet them. They can just come in and operate without a license. Shipton and Crennan suspended that. That that ended in March 2020 and all hell broke loose in the city of London. And we, we, we played this. I mean, you know, I can talk all day about the corruption of the city of London. There's a there's a, an Italian investigative journalist named Robert Saviano who who um, you can get watch on on Netflix. You, you, you can watch the series called Gomorrah which is about the Napoli um, mob that he wrote the book for, right? So he's investigated the, the, the Italian mafia from one end to the other. 
He, in 2016, he testified before the UK House of Lords and he said the city of London is the most corrupt place on earth because it's the centre of world money laundering and everything, because it's the centre of the global offshore system and whatever. Um, lots of powerful vested interests tied up in that. Shipton and Crennan said, you're not coming in here anymore without a licence. So when that, um, uh, uh, when, when Josh Frydenberg, on the same day that Christine Holgate was assassinated in Parliament, politically, um, he said in train, the orchestrated the events to get Shipton and Crennan out of there with this fake um, expenses scandal, mm. for which they were cleared. Once they were gone, uh, he's replaced him with this new guy, Joe Longo, and put more power in Joe Longo's hands. And Joe Longo was described in the Financial Review as the business-friendly regulator that Frydenberg craved. He also has made it clear in this statement of expectations he expects ASIC to list to follow what the Treasurer and Treasury say, right? So less actual independence for ASIC. They're supposed to follow what the Treasurer and Treasury says. And this is what he was at odds with Shipton about as well. Um, and then in the May budget, he announced that that equivalence relief suspension would be dropped. And once again, British financial institutions can come in here without a licence. So all these, the, the concrete things that Shipton did this government has made sure they're all gone, right? And now you've got the statement of expectations saying it's party time, boys. And like I said, this is for the banks, right? This is um, two and a half years after the Royal Commission. It is telling the banks, okay, uh, we've, shepherded, we've shepherded you through that, right? It was a bit rough, but we, we held you to our bosom, banks. We've got you, we've got you right? Yes. Well, you know the Christian... Um, thing about footprints in the sand if I <laughs> viewers will recognize this right so so the banks would be saying why was it in the hardest times of the royal commission there's only one set of footprints and Josh Frydenberg will, will say well that's when I carried you through those hard times and now we're back everyone's distracted um it's it's all systems go right and so that's great for the banks, terrible for the economy, great for the banks. But I want people to think about the victims, the Sterling First style victims and the many more out of there that will just have no hope mm -hmm. to resist this green light for predators. Yep. And that's what we need to intervene in. And Robbie, the point here is that the unequal relationship between the banks and how they actually sell products and services and, you know, compare with ordinary individuals, right? It, it's completely unequal. Yep. And, and, you know, individuals rely on the banks, for example, to say, well, you know, I can clearly afford the loan, can't I, right? You know, implicitly, they're relying on the bank for that advice. And what this government is trying to do is tease back again and again and again and putting all the acid back on those individuals. It's up to you, mate. If you want to commit, you find no problems, you know, caveat emptor. But that assumes a level of um, expertise and capability to understand what you're getting into and it's completely one-sided and that's, that's right. the real truth here so people get caught out and it's not just on day one but it's subsequent so if you look at what happens you know people get into difficulty and then struggle for years and years and years as a result of that and, and so there has to be a powerful set of protections in place to ensure that consumers and small businesses have the right degree of protection and that the banks are actually doing what they should do which is treating customers fairly and providing honored honor honest and objective advice about the products and services that they're selling it's not rocket science this and yet it is a billion miles from the philosophy and approach that the government is pushing and the way that the big banks have you know spun it over recent times yeah no for sure and can i look there's plenty of people who have done very sim silly things and got themselves into very silly things. But, you know, we're talking about the kind... What did, Was this a get-rich-quick scheme the Sterling First victims got into? No. It was a secure retirement, a pl secure place to live in their retirement scheme. Nope. That's all. Nope. They weren't buying mansions, right? They weren't, they weren't attracted... I mean, Beryl, that lady in the video, she, when I interviewed her on our show... She, had, she worked at a top Australian company, and just before she retired, they offered shares to their employees. And this is a pretty safe Australian company. She refused those shares because the last thing she ever wanted to be was an investor, right? But this was, okay, 
this this can this can this can be a, a, an affordable way to retire. That's all we want to get into. We just put up an article in our latest magazine, and it's on our um, uh, website. We can link to about a great guy just south of you there, um, Martin Wayne Ditchburn. And Wayne is the salt of the earth. He's as he's as um, uh, everyday Aussie as it gets, and he was he was done over badly by his bank. You know, we can't name the bank for legal reasons, but he was done over badly by it. And all he wanted to do was buy a house. Right. And, but the, the purpose of that story is, is he's one of those very, very few people that's so tenacious and was so driven by righteous anger at what was done to him that he just kept at it for year after year after year until finally his tenacity resulted in a, in a burst of really good luck Something happened. He found something. You can read the article on our website. It's called The Aussie Battler Takes on a Giant Bank. Um, he, he, he found this, this bit of evidence. And when the bank knew that he had it, that he found it, the jig was up. And then the bank came clean and gave him the settlement. But what he, the hoops he had to get, go through to, to um, get to that is the exception that proves the rule. Little old grandmas can't do what this great guy Wayne Ditchburn did. Right, and you cannot have a system that just says no for the sake of of not interfering with what the banks want to do. We're going to have deliberately weak regulation and never held hold it accountable for all the basic all the other victims that are caused as a result of that. Right, mm -hmm. and that's what that's what this inquiry um, call is so important for. I, I just want to emphasise the the point we make in the video as well. You know, as you know, we're in a campaign for public banks and especially a postal bank. What is what, how does it relate to this? It relates to it because it's it's the banks that dictate to the government, right? The government doesn't do this out of the goodness of its heart for the banks because it doesn't have any goodness in its heart. <laughs> um, it's captured by the banks. They're the most powerful lobby in Australia. We have to break the power of that monopoly. And there's lots of little banks that have started up and they either fall by the way, or if they're successful, one of the big banks will gobble them up. It's not enough. The only entity that can break the power of this private, this big four monopoly in Australia is the government itself. A public bank operating through the post offices can actually, it will attract a lot of customers, right? And then f suddenly the banks will know, hang on, it's competition at the retail level again, guys, and we better, we can't just... Um, uh, ignore having a, a, uh, a pile of bodies in our wake and think, well, doesn't matter because they've got nowhere else to go that's going to be any different, right? We're going to lose customers if we don't lift our game. So apart from good regulation, that's, that's going to be so important actually breaking their power. But we still need to clean up this um, ASIC and we still need to, to, to make sure that, and there's lots of other victims besides Sterling First, but make sure those victims are, are, um, have their concerns addressed. Right. And then in the case of the Sterling first victims, like I said, they, they cannot start again. They must be compensated. Um, the government should pony up the $18 million that it, that it let these, this Sterling first steal from them, essentially take from them um, uh, and then lose it all in 2019 because of ASIC's failings. They must do that and let them stay in their homes. And the government has, and you've, you know, $18 million. Compare that to the amount of money that's been bandied around for by the Reserve Bank for the banks in the last few years. What are we up to? Two hundred billion dollars, and then and that's and that's on top of the three hundred what is it? Three hundred forty billion dollar bailout fund, the committed liquidity facility that's that that, that was already there. Yep. Right. Um, don't give me this rubbish that that we can't address some of these acute problems, and that's what we need to do. Absolutely. And don't mention the three billion that was thrown at the construction sector last year through Home Builder. Right. I mean, there's there's loads of money out there for the favoured few, yep. but not for the real things. And I want to make two quick points. The first is that the various uh, legal proceedings that ASIC took, right, ended up in some cases winning. But even then, the amount of money that the banks had to pay out were very, very low. So it really was just the cost of doing business. It didn't hurt them at all, right? Until we get regulation that actually holds individuals in those organisations accountable and they are personally liable for the stuff that goes on, that's 
not going to happen. The second otherwise point, it's the shareholders that are paying. It's not even exactly, the Exactly, exactly. It's just the money goes around the circle. But the second point is this, Robbie. You know, given where we are economically, where we've got the banks pushing mortgages like there's no tomorrow because it's the only game in town, and given the fact that term deposit rates are so low, we've got more and more people desperate to find alternative investment solutions that provides a little bit more security in terms of returns, right? It's absolutely critical that the right protections are in place at yes. this time. So rather than actually turning the volume down and saying, well, we know we've got to lend for free and everything else simply because of the economic conditions. Now, the economic conditions are such that the protections need to be stronger than ever to protect people through this part of the cycle. Because they're more desperate, you're right. And they, Absolutely. therefore they can be talked into crazier things. Yeah. So here we are. So folks, it's time to pick up those phones again. And uh, we need to have a Senate inquiry into ASIC's role and ASIC. So what? So to, just to be specific, and we'll put it We'll put a couple of links below. I want to put the link to the, I want people to, if you want to see it, you can see the Wayne Ditchburn article um, that I was referring to. But the main link is to the video you've just watched. There's a, there's a link on, on our YouTube channel that's just that video. Um, use it. Send that because it's good. If Please, if you can, make a phone call, but also send an email to these members of Parliament. So we'll put, we'll put the link to um, the, the website on Parliament where you find those senators. Go to your state. Right. And if you want to call them all and, and email them all, please do as well. But at least do the 12 in your state. Um, email them. Now, some of them are going to be in Canberra next week. Some aren't because of the COVID restrictions, etc. If you know yours is in Canberra, call them at the Canberra office. Otherwise, call them at the home office or, or, or call them at both offices. Follow that up, though, with the email. Mm -hmm. Right. Email them the video so that it, and the, you don't have to. If you, if you feel confident saying more, say more. But all you got to do is say, I'm Joe Blow. I'm, there's a real Christ problem here with what's happened to Sterling first. And it just shows you how bad ASIC is. You must have an inquiry into ASIC and you must include Sterling first in that inquiry, right? Yep. So that's the message and get it to those um, senators, right? So use the, use the link for the, um, uh, the video and, and, the, and, and the link. Well, that, prov that provides the uh, the contact details for the senators. That's what you need. But what you do works. I mean, we, you know, Martin and I, it still sometimes, um, it never ceases to amaze us how effective this can be, right? <laughs> you get off this video and you pick up the phone and you make those calls and you send those emails, you're part of a flood of them. And I mean, I've, I've been talking to different networks that in the last... Um, 48 hours about this. We're going to mobilise the victims themselves. They're a sizable group. We're going to mobilise a lot, the larger community of bank victims around Australia that know this is an urgent thing that must be addressed, right? Um, get them involved in, in doing this and, and they're sharing on Facebook and all those sort of things they do, but this is a target for that. We're going to mobilise our supporters all around Australia and they, they're, um, you know, they're, they're battle hardened in this regard and, and, and they love picking up the phone and, and doing it. And next week is a window of opportunity and, and the Martin North um, audience, uh, digital finance analytics audience is an exceptional part of this because um, uh, what was it? In the middle of the, uh, uh, the Christine Holgate Australia first, in, first inquiry was the flood of calls that came from this discussion between Martin and I on this channel on a Monday morning that tipped it over the edge. And it actually was. Right. So, you know, if you're focused enough, you can really affect change in politics. And yes, we're starting with an inquiry, but it's an inquiry in a context. You've got to appreciate they're trying to pretend the Royal Commission didn't happen. Right. So if necessary, we have to replicate it again uh, and again and again until it starts to happen. And it's going to come down to the, a lot of it to the Labor Party, recognising that this is something they should be fighting on harder. If they want to be serious about being the alternative government, they need to be fighting on these things harder than they do. And that's going to come, they'll get the incentive from the phone calls they receive. Yes, Robbie. Well, thank you very much for your time today. We'll put all the links and things below. This is another opportunity to have a significant influence on you know, policy, but also the future economic direction of Australia. And that's something that we can be proud to be part of. So come on, folks. Make those calls, send those emails. Let's do it again. Yep. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, viewers. Thank you. See ya. See ya.